what is your idea about Bodhisattva Bao? Because, of course, all of us know that I come from Mahayana. We are raised to be, uh, my teachers always tell us that, oh, we're going to become a Bodhisattva. You need to, you know. <laughs> so what is your idea in Theravada perspective? What do you feel about that? <laughs> because sometimes I feel shy talking in front of Theravada monks because we always mention that oh we have these Bodhisattvas and Bodhisattvas we always connect it, the name and they look at me it's like oh, what is this talking about <laughs> so I feel strange sometimes so in your opinion what could you say well to me to me it's it is like an altruism you know, because it's very higher-minded, and it has its beauty, you know. It's inspiring. But also, it's another creation of the mind. And so the, and <coughs> it's not putting it down, but, you know, I think one of the attractions to Mahayana Buddhism is it's, it's inspiring, more inspiring than Theravada. And... Uh, and inspiration is is uh, what many of us want to be inspired. But, and this is where the mindfulness practice will help you just to observe your own feelings about this this uh, this this idea of the bodhisattva. And it's not to say you know you don't. It's not about criticizing. It's just noticing and trust more the awareness of it than trying to decide whether you should drop it or carry it on or whatever. It's about just seeing things for what they are so that you're more confident in being this this knowing than in trying to justify or deny the ideal. But this you can do. It's not like you have to get rid of the bodhisattva idea <laughs> to be Theravada <laughs> but I mean if you do if you do think that somebody tells you that then that has its effect on your mind but so trust yourself more to be the observer when somebody says oh we don't have the bodhisattva this is rubbish <laughs> money on a jingle jangle and uh, like, how does that affect yeah, I, feel, <laughs> I feel like I feel so strange because <laughs> If you go to Mahayana temple, all Chinese monastics, they make a vow that I'm going to become a bodhisattva or Buddha, not in this uh, lifetime, but in my next lifetime. So I'm, I know that you're aware of it. And even my teachers, like all of us are bodhisattvas, and they are dressed as, oh, chan for pusa, chan for bodhisattvas. Like, okay. And all lay people, they want to become a bodhisattva. So that's why I ask this question. Well, it's just it's another concept to observe. And my question is, now I'm here studying in a Theravada community. I made a research in that Theravada don't really accept Mahayana sutras. And then my teacher really, you know, insists that you should study all the Mahayana sutras. Go to Sutra, Avatam Saka, Diamond Sutra. Theravada don't recognize all our sutras. Yeah, well, how many people really studied Mahayana to know? <laughs> I mean, we all have our prejudices from our religious preferences. So, you know, the, I never, I, I read Diamond Sutra and the Heart Sutra I had. What's the one they use in, at City of 10,000 Buddhas? Uh, Surangama. Surangama. It's the one that is about this long. It might be the Surangama. is the longest. And they study that. But actually, <laughs> Master Shu and Wa was wanted me to give desanas on mindfulness. So, I mean, it's... I don't really know, because I've not pr really practiced Mahayana Buddhism, but... You know, I never could relate to that side of it because of my name, my character, and I'm brought up in a totally different culture. 
the, the thing that attracted me to Buddhism was this direct approach. Especially, like in, in Zen, you get it, and in and in uh, and then in uh, Theravada, it's very clearly stated. And then Theravadins do have a conceit that Mahayana is all, you know. But that's they, nobody really knows. It's just, you know, if you've never studied it, how do you know? If you've never practiced with it. Where does it take you? You know, we we form opinions. <laughs> about other religions that we don't understand them like I was brought up as a Christian and Christians regard all other religions as inferior that Jesus is the only way and I began to realize that you know the Christians I knew didn't know anything about Buddhism but they could say it's 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 not the way they didn't know anything about it so then I <laughs> I thought, well, how can they say anything about something they don't know? It's just a prejudice of a religious group. You know, I realized my mother and father didn't, it had a clue what Buddhism is, but they had opinions about it, that it's not the way. You know, because that's what Christians believe. And that's a belief, you know, it's only through Jesus that you can be saved. So, when I became a Buddhist monk, they were very upset at first. Because I'm a baptized Christian and confirmed and everything. So, my mother said, you can't become a Buddhist because you're baptized as a Christian. <laughs> but later on, my parents became more tolerant because I actually introduced Buddhism into their lives. That's something they didn't know anything about. They just had these religious opinions that, that you have from your own preference, your own religious preference. And this is where this kind of practice will get you to, to that center point where you, you can, you know, it's not about taking sides anymore about Mahayana or Theravada, but just being more awake to the way the mind functions and, and grasping of views and opinions. And then you see the suffering you create around grasping, you let go. So like the Four Noble Truths is, is a very uh, very good tool to use. You know, if, if, you're, if you believe in Mahayana and you, uh, and then you think Theravada is, is kind of primitive Buddhism that never developed, when you really look at that opinion, you know, you start observing that view. It's not a peaceful view. It, you know, it's a, it puts you in contrast to something else, like the Mahayana's right, Theravada is, a, is, is still dividing everything up, splitting your mind into taking sides. Where with, with mindfulness, you're actually in a unicity, in the universal wisdom, rather than in a intellectual or condition preference because you know in every religion they like you know Catholics and Protestants and Shia and Sunnis and all the rest are, I mean they're murdering each other in Iraq and Syria and now and they're all Muslims <laughs> because why? Because they're attached to their own cultural preference. The way they've been conditioned to regard it as a reality. And then, uh, you know, and that happens everywhere. You know. Christianity is great for that, isn't it? Uncle Terry was saying he's another stuff that he kind of restrained his open mind around 50 years ago. And he said, uh, he felt like he was completely ignored. Every other place he felt everyone staring at him. He said he realized because he was Buddhist, they're more concerned about he was kind of like a Protestant. And if he obviously wasn't, he seemed to place that he was completely ignored. <laughs> well, even in, you know, Thai forest tradition, we can feel we're much superior to the Wat Ban. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's taking sides, isn't it? 
or Tommy Yukani Kai or Ajahn Chah tradition. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's that's the function of thinking mind. It's a divisive, it's a discriminating function. You know, thinking is about right and wrong, good and bad, true and false. These are all, if you have one concept, you have to have its opposite. And so, you know, then the thinking mind is, a, is its function in the universe is to discriminate. This is bigger than that. This is better, that's worse. This is, the thinking mind is, is that's what it's for, is discriminating the conditioned realm, you know, so it, it functions on that level, but you get beyond the thinking mind, there's still consciousness, you can stop thinking and still be conscious, mindfulness, and then you've got perspective on the conditioning, you know, like we've all been conditioned, culturally conditioned, uh, socially conditioned, you know, so we have, you know, the families we're born into, we're, we're conditioned by what our mother thinks, or father, and the social group we're in, the, what class we, we align with. We're conditioned to believe that, uh, that I'm a man, and there's men and women. We're conditioned to think I'm this body, male body. And not to, it's not that these are wrong, but this is conditioning. It's made up by human beings who are unenlightened. So, you, you know, you, it's, not, it's conventionally workable, but it's not ultimately real. So, like Ajahn Chah would emphasize all the time about Paramatta Satcha and Samuti Satcha, like Paramatta Satcha is ultimate reality and Samuti is conventional reality. So like the Vinaya's conventional reality. And then the Thai culture's conventional reality. Or Mahayana Buddhism, Theravada, these are conventions. They're conventions, you know, they're formed, they have shape. So there is a difference between Mahayana and Theravada. There's a difference between Sunni and Shia. And then we're conditioned to identify with them, and which is which is the best, which is the real true Buddhism and which is the false and we take sides through thinking, through the discriminating conditioned mind and then once we're we see the suffering that we create in our minds through that it doesn't mean we, we discard conventional reality but we're no longer kind of enslaved to its out of ignorance to seeing things only from a conventional bias through a conditioned perspective because we have a we you know you're in tune with ultimate reality you've gone through the gate of the deathless so amatasa tawara the door to the deathless and uh, they talk about the deathless like mara uh, is uh, about death. The word Mara in Pali is the word for death, and then Amatasa Amara, Amaro, Amaro, what the, <laughs> the deathless. Now, you can't conceive deathlessness. You have the concept, but you can't imagine it. Never dying. You can maybe even wish to never die and live forever, but that's the creation of the mind. But, uh, you know, in, in condition phenomenon is about dying. It's all birth and death. You know, there's a, an emotion or a thought or, you know, condition phenomena, that's his nature. As long as we're attached to condition phenomena, then we're attached to death is our Final, final moment, you know, that's the end. Or, and then we have hopes that I'll go to heaven or become a bodhisattva or be reincarnated as a Buddha or whatever. But that is still the thinking process. And so the, the Buddha established this 
teaching on something that is very recognizable in the present, you know, like suffering, to save us from, from trying to get caught up in our minds about the nature of life, the meaning of life, what happens when you die, and all the rest of it. And notice, like, the pronouns we have, is I, and me, and mine, and these, these tend to always define ourselves as a form, as a physical form, as the, this is mine and that's yours and you know, I'm an American, you're Filipino, this kind of thing is like it's, these are conventional workable realities but they're not ultimate, ultimately true. You see, if people really observe this a lot of the, you know, like war and all this, this economic, uh, you know, the obsession with materialism and and trying to make money and free market capitalism, where you you're constantly trying to make people discontented and greedy. You know, advertis- advertisements are set up to make you greedy for something. <laughs> And so our culture is based on this, this need to make us very greedy for everything. It all looks good, and, and it's, this year's model is, you know, improvement on last year's. And so this, this appeals, you know, it's based on what is better, and it's modern, and it's progressive. These words, how, you know, that's how they affect your mind. That you can know. But the society we live in is is like this. It, capitalism is like this. You, you know, not, it's not not a judgment. It's just a willingness to open to this this concept and the and the the kind of attitudes of the present age that are promoted through the society. Not that we have to make judgments, but we can see how they affect us. Like if you get caught up in those ideals, then you always you never be content. And and then the seminal life is about being content with very little. So, so, so you know, and even in the sangha it works. You know, who you know, I, that monk has a cell phone and makes me I want one. And so this is oh you know I've been. I've been envious of other, um, when stainless steel Oswalds came into being, I remember, I, I wanted one. <laughs> My Oswald was actually good enough, but it created this desire, you know, because, uh, you know, you didn't, stainless steel wouldn't rust. And so even, you know, this greed is aroused even through, you know, the envy of some other monk. But at least you can use it as awareness. You see, it's not person. It, you're taking the personal feeling of it by observing it. <laughs>